Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker. I'm part of the English faculty here at Brookdale, as well as the director of the Creative Writing Program. I'm very excited today to have on my show Rick Moody. Rick is the author of five novels, most recently The Four Fingers of Death, as well as two short story collections, a collection of novellas, Write Livelihoods, and a memoir called The Black Veil. He is the winner of numerous awards, including the Addison Metcalf Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, Paris Review's Aga Khan Prize, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Rick, it's nice to have you on the show. Thanks, Suzanne. You know, I just wanted to start off kind of talking about you as a writer. Um, you know, you've written five novels, uh, two short story collections, a novella, a memoir. You have a music blog, I think, for the online magazine The Rumpus, and you're also a musician. Um, and I was really thinking about talking to you and how I would describe your work, and I, I was like, wow. So I'm going to ask you instead, you know, if you were writing your own Wikipedia entry to describe sort of Rick Moody's oove, your range, what would you say? I try never to do stuff like that. I've studiously avoided the <laughs> Wikipedia page. But I suppose if you, if you were going to really try to pin me down, that I would say unclassifiable and partly right. because I've made it my job to make each book completely different from the book before it and to move sideways in terms of genre at every opportunity partly to defeat getting pigeonholed in a certain way you know when mm -hmm. I when I published the novel The Ice Storm uh, there was this sort of rush because there were a couple other books by contemporaries of mine that were set in the suburbs in that period to create a catch-all term for what was happening. And the term that they arrived at was suburban gothic. And the second that it was applied, I felt that it didn't fit and I was desperate to try to change up the delivery in a way so that no mm -hmm. such application of critical terminology would ever stick. Would ever apply to you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said it was your job. So this has been a conscious choice. You know, at the end of a book, do you think, okay, I've done this. You know, I've told the, the story of suburban dysfunction. Now I'm going to do a 180 and go in the opposite direction? It's less, um, it's probably less programmatic than, than that and more mm -hmm. intuitive that I just feel restless. And mm -hmm. if I've done something, it's hard for me to revisit that terrain. And my wish is to try to push the form somewhere it hasn't gone before. Mm -hmm. um, and so upon exhausting certain kinds of material, then I just feel like, well, what can I do now that it's completely different? Um, usually though, it's because the story that I've come up with or that I'm toying with in my mind, um, for whatever reason, perhaps my subconscious or the way I work creatively or whatever, I just become preoccupied with characters who for whatever reason are from a completely different milieu. Probably because, mm. I mean, I'm sure you find this reading the literature of great writers past that, uh, um, every book is a relief in a certain way. You can't wait to work with people who are from a different spot in the country or mm -hmm. a different socioeconomic class or in a different circumstance just because the last one took a lot out of you and you don't want to keep doing that over and over. Sure. Yet you did write a memoir, The Black Veil. So listening to you talk about the idea of kind of want to move on to this character and, and kind of move on to this thing, how was it writing the memoir? where you know, your story was yourself? I thought it was going to be really easy and painless. <laughs> yeah. I had written this story um, called Demonology that was in a, a collection mm -hmm. that I published uh, right before the Blackville. I was sort of working on them at the same time. Mm -hmm. That story was primarily autobiographical, and it had this charmed life as a piece of short fiction. It, Everybody mm -hmm. kind of liked it. It got anthologized all over the place. Um, and the mistake that I made was to think that because that story came relatively easily that it might be easy to write an entire memoir. Um, and I hear a butt coming up. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
that because that the sort of confessional apparatus of that story had not been a challenge, you know, I had wanted to write that story, that maybe I had a confessional muscle of some kind, mm -hmm. but that turned out to be not necessarily the case. And The Black Veil as a book length project was the hardest book I've ever written. Um, it took like four and a half years and mm. uh, the really dark material at the center mm. of it, I blocked. It's the only time that I've ever blocked in my career because uh, I just wasn't sure if I was really able to talk about it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to sit here and say that uh, that the nonfiction, the confessional nonfiction impulse is easy for me because it's really not. I think I'm a fiction writer mm -hmm. uh, true, through and through. And um, the story demonology had just enough artifice in it to give me a screen sure. from feeling vulnerable to the material. Uh, but I didn't have that with the Black Veil. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it was hard to write, hard to tour, hard to talk about after the fact, you know, just really a difficult moment for me. So probably not going to do another memoir, I guess, for a long time. You know, <laughs> if I turned 75, I might write a sort of a literary memoir of some kind, mm -hmm. but I, I certainly don't want to talk about my life anymore. Hmm. Yeah, speaking of your life, though, how did you come to writing? You come from a family that has a I know uh, your, your grandfather, was it? I was a newspaper publisher, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, everybody read. I mean, I'm sure this is true of many contemporary writers. I, I don't think that I had a unusual story um, in that uh, I didn't sort of wake up with the storytelling muscle fully formed. That mm -hmm. wasn't the case. I just read like a maniac and my parents read mm -hmm. like maniacs. Um, and as I said, my grandfather, you know, was tangentially in the writing business to some extent. And just having all those books around and, and being in an environment where they took books seriously, mm -hmm. it just rubbed off on me. And it didn't exactly rub off on my siblings in the same way. They read, but they weren't quite as uh, thirsty for it as I was. But when I finally came to wanting to write, it was really just because I wanted to be on the shelf with the other, <laughs> you know, exciting uh, heroes of my childhood. Who were the heroes? Well, initially, uh, I mean, I sort of had a, I moved out of the Hardy Boys and went straight into sort of um, Salinger and some Hemingway and uh -huh. some Fitzgerald. Uh, but I had a side trip through sort of science fiction and the countercultural voices mm -hmm. like Vonnegut and Richard Brodigan mm -hmm. and Tom Robbins and stuff like that. So the, the early teens for me, which was really the moment when I kind of took off mm -hmm. um, as a person who aspired to get into this way of life, had a lot to do with those guys. And and really, The Four Fingers of Death as a book is meant to be a sort of an homage to those books and Vonnegut in particular. Didn't you, um, remember correctly, you were, you did a comic strip at one point, didn't you? For, I did for details, details, yeah. Yeah. Which was really fun. Yeah, did I you do the, the cartoons as well? Or the no, drawing? just the text. Just the text. Yeah, no, they got this really great DC Comics guy to draw them, and they were fabulous. Ah, oh, great. Yeah. Great. Um, after the break, I definitely want to talk about the new book, The Four Fingers of Death. And, and this is a wild book. I mean, it's, it's like a, a fabulous amusement park ride in a way. And I wonder, where do you get your ideas? Do you, bring, do you begin with characters or story? And, and where, where do those ideas pop up from? It's funny you should ask that question because, of course, the first sentence of The Four Fingers of Death is, people often ask me where I get my ideas. <laughs> and the narrator never answers it. Um, <laughs> There's what, 735 pages, <laughs> and yet he cannot bring himself to answer it. Um, it's hard for me to talk about that sometimes because mm. the, I, the initial part of an idea gets so layered over with the apparatus of, of the place and time and the mm -hmm. people and their effects that sometimes it's hard for me to remember where and how I got the initial idea. But yeah. I will say 
that the, that this book has a lot to do with a really bad B horror film from 1963 called The Crawling Hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was walking through Walmart, where I don't go often, probably <laughs> 2003 or four, mm -hmm. and they had one of those gigantic vats of 3.99 DVDs. Mm -hmm. And I love to root around in there for stuff that other people would find contemptible. And uh, I pulled out the Crawling Hand Rhino edition. Um, and I remembered it from my childhood oh, because did. I had watched horror movies every Saturday. Uh, Is that you... that like afternoon Saturday block where they do like double features? Well, um, I watched the 430 movie every day where they had, you know, a lot of horror movies. But mm. I was thinking of the Saturday night ones in New York, which were Chiller Theater, which I believe is on Channel 11, and uh -huh. Creature Features on oh, Channel gosh, yeah. 5. <laughs> I do so, remember that one. <laughs> yeah, so The Crawling Hand for me was a relic of my family life from my earliest memory. And uh, so the idea was just to rewrite this story that I was so fond of when I was a kid. We only have a, a little bit of time before we go to break, but did, did you watch the movie again and again while you were writing the book? Well, you don't have to watch it that many times. Once was enough. <laughs> it's not <laughs> worthy of excess investigation, but I did. I watched it again, for yeah. sure. And is it a fabulously awful movie? Yeah, it's into the Ed Wood level of badness, actually. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, we're going to take a break, but I'm talking with author Rick Moody right now on the Brickdale Visiting Writer Series show. Please join us after break. I'm Graham Rahal, a race car driver in the Champ Car World Series. Whether I'm reaching speeds of nearly 200 miles per hour on the racetrack or driving at home on the street, I always keep my hands on the wheel. Recent studies show that most crashes and near crashes involve some form of driver distraction. Please don't text while driving. The consequences can be very serious. Keep your hands on the wheel. Join me and my fellow drivers in the Champ Car World Series by taking the pledge at handsonthewheel.org. One by one. They step forward. A nurse. A teacher. A homemaker. And lives are saved. But the problem is enormous. Every three seconds, one person dies. Another three seconds. One more. The situation is so desperate in parts of Africa. Asia. Even America. That aid groups. Just as they did for the tsunami. Are uniting. As one. Acting. As one. We can beat extreme poverty. Starvation. AIDS. But we need your help. One more person. Letter. Voice. Will mean the difference between life and death. For millions of people. Please join us. By working together. Americans have an unprecedented opportunity. We can make history. We can start to make poverty history. One. By one. By one. Please visit one at this address. We're not asking for your money. We're asking for your voice. And welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm talking today with Rick Moody, author of, most recently, The Four Fingers of Death. Welcome back. Thanks. Um, before the break, we were sort of talking about where you get your ideas and all the rest of it. And I'm very interested, as somebody who has written, you know, a short story that was 650 words exactly, up into, you know, Four Fingers of Death, which is 700 and... 43, 33? 35, I think, something like that, yeah. It's a long book. Yeah. <laughs> and you've got novellas, you've got, you know, longer short stories. I wonder, when you, when you get an idea, you start writing, do you have in mind, this is going to be a short story, or this is going to be a novella, or this is going to be a bigger project? How does that happen for you? You kind of just know after a while, um, in the same way that you go out for a run and feel like you're only going to make it three miles today. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's intuitive to that extent. But the other side of it is that more and more as I, as I go on and do what I do, I feel loath to compromise with 
sort of market pressures about length. Mm. And so I sort of feel like it should be whatever length it wants to be. And then, you know, there's a problem figuring out where to publish things, but it's not that big a problem. I mean, mm -hmm. you can find a magazine to take a novella these days if you work hard enough at mm -hmm. it. Um, and I feel like the sort of rigid adherence to length as a demarker for genre is a bookstore problem, not a literary problem. Hmm. You know, literature should go wherever it wants to go, wherever the language wants it to go. And short story ends up just being a name for something that happens that's not hmm. novel length, you know. Um, but there's a lot of gray area in there, and there should be a lot of gray area. I mean, yeah. the story should be as long as it takes to tell the story, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that said, the difficult form for me is is the really short piece now. I mean, it's very hard for me to write a 16-page short story. I can't. I don't do it easily. Why? Because I think about characters and psychology in such a way that for me to get to somebody now requires much more space than that mm. to sort of summon up their consciousness in a way that seems adequate and compassionate to that person. Mm -hmm. uh, 16 pages really, or even 25, is hard for me to manage. So kind of... For me, a short story is like a poem. It's like a sonnet, you know, mm -hmm. it's that short, really. I always think of it, you know, you're writing, you know, with uh, the four fingers, kind of a mural size novel, and now you, to, to do a short story must really feel like doing miniature painting in a way. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember one time. time saying to a guy, I could write a short story about someone picking up a cup of coffee. And that's sort of how I feel about it now, that if you, if you were to really describe that instant and everything that went into the mm -hmm. character picking up the cup and all the context and backstory, that would be plenty for 16 pages. You don't really need that much more action than that. <laughs> it all leads up to just picking <laughs> yeah. up the cup, done. <laughs> um, well, that's interesting that you say that it's, you know, the art dictates, the story dictates what it needs. Because, you know, looking back at Garden State and the ice storm and then kind of reading through the books, your language, you know, really the sentence level writing, kind of around um, like Purple America, kind of opens up a little bit. It gets looser, kind of elliptical, longer sentences, and the sentences sort of kind of burrow down and then kind of spring forward. And I wonder, was that an, a, a conscious choice? Like you'd had Ice Storm, which was a big success. Obviously it was made into the film. Was there sort of a permission of, you know, my name is recognized now, I can kind of write the kind of sentences I want to write? Or how did, how did it open up like that? It was more that with the first two books, I, I just didn't yeah. know how to use the novel form very well. Hmm. I mean, usually when I talk about it, I say that what happened was when I got to part three of the ice storm, I had to kill a character, mm -hmm. which I'd never done before. And, um, and I was so invested in that book. I mean, it sounds silly and sentimental, but I was so invested in the people and what it required for me in terms of doing justice to them, that killing the character really felt like a kind of loss. Mm -hmm. And um, so in trying to figure out how to do it and do justice to the moment, I suddenly needed language that I hadn't had at my disposal before oh. if I was only using short declarative sentences. And really, Garden State and the beginning of the ice storm are much more declarative mm -hmm. in terms of their style. Um, so when this poor guy got, went to his uh, eternal reward, it needed a syntax that was much more complex. Mm -hmm. It turns out that that syntax that I reached for was the one that comes naturally to me, that writing the simple sentences was an affectation. Mm -hmm. uh, and one that I, in some ways, undertook because I thought that that was how one got published, mm. that it was hard to get away with a more um, complicated and Baroque stylistic approach. But once I went through the door, it, it turned out that it was really hard to go back. And so mm. the books after that, Purple America being the, probably the best example, 
um, made it possible for me to really take those stylistic ideas and expand on them. And, uh, and having done so, that's been the writer that I have been since that time. When you were writing the first couple books, were you aware of sort of consciously trying to, to mimic a style or to produce a style? Or was it kind of only after the fact you thought, wow, I'm so much more relaxed now? <laughs> well, <clears throat> part of it is this mythic search for one's voice that they talk about in writing mm -hmm. school all the time, which I always felt a little bit like that was, that I was being sold a bill of goods, you know. But um, the, the struggle for me in grad school was that I had kind of grown up loving experimental mm -hmm. writing, but I was going to graduate school during the ascendancy of minimalist realist writing, mm -hmm. which is to say Carver, mm -hmm. Richard Ford, Bobby Ann Mason, you know, uh, Rick Barthelme, stuff like that. Those works were all written with really kind of transparently understated prose yeah. styles. And that was what everybody was using at Columbia when I was there. And indeed, I was sort of not a happy camper in grad school for coming from a yeah. different place. Uh, so I sort of thought, I've got to make these compromises because this is what everybody likes and sure. what everybody's reading, you know. And I tried to shoehorn myself into something that was closer to that style that was the mm -hmm. uber style in 1986. Um, but then I just found that I, I couldn't make myself couldn't do it, do it yeah. after a point. Well, f from, from freeing up the language, we now have uh, the Four Fingers of Death, which it, it's taken that idea and it's just everything about it is, is kind of free and, and jumping and all the rest of it. So um, for people who haven't read the book yet, could you describe it to them? Well, it's basically a slightly futurist retelling of that very bad horror film, The Crawling mm -hmm. Hand, and it's set in uh, the Southwest in 2026. Um, and the first half of the book concerns a failed mission to Mars by the United States. Um, so it takes us all the way to the Red Planet and mm -hmm. all the horrible things that happen there the tragicomic things that happen there. And then the second half of the book concerns what remains of the mission, which is a certain body part that falls out of the sky <laughs> and lands in the Tucson area, basically, mm -hmm. uh, where it proceeds to wreak havoc on the local population. That's the book as a whole. There's also a frame story yeah. in which a poor, luckless writer of the near future um, contracts to write this whole remake, telling novelization of the remake mm -hmm. of The Crawling Hand um, in order to try to drum up some funds for his wife who's in dire medical condition. So that's the frame story. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. More around. than enough, unfortunately. Uh, was there a did you always have this, these kind of three layers to it, or three sections to it? Or did you write one and then think, I should write more? Because in between book one and book two, there's sort of the introductions like, well, none of that really is what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so right. how, how did that happen? Well, first I was just going to do the crawling hand material. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I decided it was silly to do that without doing the Mars part. And then as I was thinking about all of that, I kind of had this idea that I was going to do an introduction like the introductions in Vonnegut novels, mm -hmm. you know, which are sort of genre hopping. He basically addresses the audience directly mm -hmm. um, in the first person. And it's really hard to say where the introduction ends and the action of the book begins mm -hmm. and how exactly it seamlessly moves from chatty nonfiction into fiction. I loved that idea and I was going to try to do it, but in the midst of attempting to do it, I auctioned off a character name in my book for a charity. I sort of gave the right to claim a character name to really? whomever paid the highest price. And uh, the word came back 
that the name I had won was Montese Crandall. Oh, that's great. And I so loved the name yeah. that I just decided to make that person the writer of the intro. Imagine if it had been like Joe Brown. Nothing against Joe Brown, of course. But that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but it has been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. My and pleasure. We've been talking with uh, Rick Moody, whose new book is called The Four Fingers of Death. And I'm Suzanne Parker, director of the creative writing program here at Brookdale. If you're interested in our shows, please um, check out the website for upcoming events. All of our visiting writer series are open to the public, free, and we encourage people to come. As well, the creative writing program has many classes that non-degree students can enroll in. So please check out our website, look for our fiction, poetry classes, screenwriting classes, and upcoming visiting writer series events. Again, I'm Suzanne Parker, and thanks for watching the show. Mm -hmm.